Good morning, Water of Life. How are you doing today? Great, great to have you here. I did just want to welcome you here to church today, as well as welcome to our online community that is tuning in. Well, my name is Lauren, and I will be your host this morning. Pleasure to be here with you. We have a few things going on, but before, I just wanted to also welcome anyone who it might be their first time here. So if you are new here, we would love to connect with you. Our church would love to reach out, get to know you, share the heart of water of life. So if you are new here, if you could text CONNECT to 818-818, we would love to reach out and connect with you. Well, it is summertime at Water of Life, and everyone knows that summertime is full of fun here and amazing things that we have going on. To first start that off, we have um, our global outreach which is hosting our fireworks booths. Now these firework booths are located throughout the city. There's three different locations and you can visit our website, wateroflifecc.org to find out where those booths are and also to find out how to support our missionaries. See these booths, the sales from these booths go to help send our mission teams overseas. And so you can help and by participating with those fireworks. Well, we also have an amazing outreach opportunity. July 23rd, our City Link is hosting an outreach called Back to School Bash. Now, this is a great opportunity for us as a church community to care for the local community. And it is a hard time sometimes to provide school supplies for children. And so this outreach is specifically for those families in our own backyard. And there's a few ways that you could join and participate in this outreach. The first is to serve the day of. The, there's many opportunities to do that. The other is to donate items. Now there's gonna be donation bins all around our campuses for you to go ahead and drop off your donations. Now one very interesting and cool thing that we have this year is if you go onto the website, you will be able to find a list of items to be donated. And you'll be able to send them directly to CityLink themselves. So that's great for us here as well as our online community. So for more information about that, just check out wateroflifecc.org. Now lastly, we have an amazing event, one of the most exciting events for our kids this summer. It is our Summer Spectacular. Now we are so excited. We are so excited because just in just a few weeks, we have hundreds of kids coming to our campus to learn the Bible stories, to be uh, led by leaders and do crafts and games and all sorts of exciting th things. And this time is going to be so amazing for these kids. Our theme this year is called The Incredible Race. And our kids will get a chance to learn that they too themselves can run the race. They are called to run the race. They are called to share the good news and the grace of God. Well, we cannot put on this event without the help of our church community because we have hundreds of kids coming. And so what we would like to ask, if there's anyone here who feels led to volunteer, we are still in need of about 50 more adults to serve the week of BBS Summer Spectacular, July 18th through the 21st. So if you are interested in joining us to help pour into our kids, pour into the grandkids, pour into the next generation, sign up at wallkids.org or you can find us on the concourse after service. Don't forget, signups also end on Monday, so register soon. Well, enough about hearing about Summer Spectacular from me. Are you guys ready? Because I would like to give you a taste of what Summer Spectacular is actually going to be like. Let's welcome up our Summer Spectacular 2022 Kids Worship Team. Now these kids have been working for weeks all summer to create an amazing worship experience for hundreds of kids that will be here. Now if you can join us and stand for a time of worship, encourage these kids and worship with us. Let's give it up for those kids. So as you can see, this event is going to be life changing for hundreds of kids. You guys can remain standing as we transition into a time of worship. 
But first, if you would like to worship the Lord with your tithes and offerings, we do have boxes located in the back, as well as you can um, do it on the, our website or on our mobile app. Now let's pray. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for today, Lord. We thank you for all your children, Lord. We thank you for who you are and how you've created each one of these people here. Lord, we just pray that our ears are open and our hearts are ready to receive the message you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen.
us to have it figured out when we come to you, Lord. We don't have to have cleaned up or fixed ourselves. That's what you want to do. That's the work that you do inside of us. And so, Lord, as we sing to you, would you continue just to do deep work in our hearts? Lord, we recognize that you are so faithful. You are so good. You are so deserving of our praise and our love and our song. Do I am your good, good father to 
we get to be loved by you. Would you help us, Lord, to receive that as our identity even deeper? God, we're so grateful that your grace and your mercy would call us children, would call us friends. Lord, we're grateful for your love in this place and that when we come into your presence together, Lord, you do such great things. It's so good to be in your midst. It's so good to be surrendered to what you wanna do in us. Lord, we're thankful that you do it all in love. You are a loving and good Father. Would you continue to have your way in this place today? We pray this all in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Good morning, Water of Life. Hey, why don't you turn and say hello to somebody you don't know before you take your seat and we'll get into the message. Good morning, good morning, good morning. How are you today? That, that mean, that's really like super weak. It's like, I thought worship was amazing all weekend and worship has been amazing. So I hope you got blessed. You're probably wondering what these guys are doing up here. They're all in the principal's office because they're all in trouble. <clears throat> no, actually this is a team that's going to Uganda this week. So we're gonna pray for them and um, we're going to Uganda. Some of you have heard and some of you probably haven't heard, but Pastor Glenn fell in Uganda this week and broke his hip. So he's having a hip surgery on Tuesday, having a hip replacement on Tuesday. Kind of threw our trip into chaos. And I say our trip because I'm going with them and we're leaving on Friday for two weeks to Africa. So we want to pray for them. Um, everybody's going to Africa except for this guy over here. This is Anthony. Anthony is going to Italy, Lord willing. So Anthony is a young man that I met in Bishop, California. And um, he is like a first generation guy who came out of Mexico when he was 12. First person in his family to graduate from high school. And um, so he, he really doesn't have any support. None of his family are believers and he doesn't have any support. So I kind of took him under my wing about a year or so ago and been trying to help him to fulfill the destiny God has set before him. So he's, he's with Youth With A Mission and he's trying to raise $7,000 to get to Italy. So I said, come here, we're gonna believe God and we'll touch people's hearts and help you to do that. So we'll pray for Anthony and then we'll pray for all of these guys. Father, we wanna come. Thank you for our brother. Thank you for, at a young age, he made a decision to be part of the kingdom of God and to commit his life to that. And, so we do ask that you would make a way for him to, to get to Italy to help plant uh, a work there that would touch people's lives. And so thank you for his passion for the kingdom. Thank you for his desire to please you, Father. And so we do pray that you would make a way for him, provision for him and blessing for him, Father. Thank you, Lord. And then God, I wanna pray for each of the guys on this team. All of them are leaders in our church, Father. All of them are pastors or elders or leaders of some sort. And we ask for each of them that this would be a supernatural time, God, that you would touch them, that you would use them. And you gone and we pray for Pastor Glenn, that you would heal his hip, that you would heal his life, touch him. Thank you for his zeal to continue to touch Sudanese refugees and care for people in spite of how sick he is himself. And we pray for your hand on his life and on our lives as we travel. We pray that you'd create supernatural divine appointments for us to touch people. And then you would anoint us, Holy Spirit, with power and authority to speak into people's lives. Speak your word to speak your heart into people's lives, Father. So thank you for each of these guys and pray that you would give us a safe journey in this supernatural time in Africa in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. Okay. We love getting teams back out. We just sent a team out to Thailand this week 
And we are excited after COVID to finally start getting teams on the ground and touching people again around the world. So that is, um, that's happening right now. I, I want to read a text to you really quick. Um, something happened this week that certainly we need to speak to it briefly, but there was a decision by the Supreme Court that um, was gigantic in terms of uh, depending on wherever you lie in the whole um, abortion issue. But I want to explain something to you as a church that's, I think, very, very important in this discussion. Um, clearly, if you've been around Water of Life for any length of time, you know that um, we believe, we teach the Bible, we believe the Bible very clearly teaches that God views a child in a womb as a person. And so we taught this just a few weeks ago out of Jeremiah when God was speaking over Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4, it says, The word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I had already set you apart and consecrated you. I have appointed you to be a prophet to the nations. Now, clearly God has done this in a number of people's lives in the Bible, but he did it in your life and my life, is that God puts his hand on you when you're in the womb and sets destiny before you. So you can see that in John the Baptist, in Jesus, in Paul's life. You can see a number of people in Scripture that this has taken place. So when we talk about um, this ruling that happened with Roe and Wade this week, um, one of the things that, that has been troubling for me, and I need to just be really direct with you, is to watch Christians cheering um, and saying, yay, that Roe versus Wade got overturned. And, and um, certainly I, I was pleased that that happened, but, but only at a certain level. And I need to tell you why. Because the issue here is never a law or an ideology. For Jesus, the issue is always a person, always. So whenever you deal with ideologies and you deal with laws in the Supreme Court, whether you're dealing with gay marriage or transgender issues or you're dealing with LBGDQ rights or you're dealing with abortion or all these hot topics in our culture, we tend to side up with one side or the other side. And today we find our land very fractured because of that. And certainly scripture has a lot to say about all these things. But the reality is if you study the life of Jesus, you know that Jesus always walked with a great tension. And the tension was that he loved the people no matter what the position was. And we don't do that very well today, friends, we don't. What happens is if our side wins a court case, then we cheer and ram it down the other side's throat. And if they win a court case, they ram it down the other side's throat. And so today what you have is a very fractured land. And if you want to be a person that makes a difference in your culture, you want to be a person that makes a difference in people's lives, you've got to understand this. It was never about adultery for Jesus when he dealt with the lady who had adultery. It was always about the lady. It was about saving her from herself and her brokenness. It went the Samaritan woman who was a whore. I mean, she had five men in her life. You know, and, and Jesus, it was never about where, where she had sold herself out. It was never about the law and what she had become this pariah in the culture. It was never about that for Jesus. It was always about the woman. And that's always how Jesus is. It's not about the ideology, friends, because ideologies don't change the world. People do. And that's why Paul was able to go to Rome and change the world, because he understood the heart of God. And if you're going to be a kingdom of God kind of person, you've got to figure this out. It's not ever the ideology or the law. It's always the person that God goes after. He always goes past the law past the court case, past the belief system to the heart of the person and says, look at, I love you no matter whether you disagree with me or you don't. Remember Jesus said this, love your enemy. Hello? You will know my people because they will look different from everybody else. They will love people who hate them. They will care for people who disagree with them. And friends, we don't do that very well today. That's a place we really need to grow in this whole discussion. If we're going to be world changers and kingdom builders, you've got to learn to get past all the stuff to the heart of the person and love the people. Does this make sense to anybody? <clears throat> you've you got to do that. That doesn't mean, I'm not saying this. I am not saying you can't hold a position. You, I'm, not, I'm not saying anything like that. I'm saying this. 
Don't let that frame your life. Let the heart of God frame your life and his heart for people because that was always what Jesus did. Okay, enough of that, but let's talk about this. A couple of things really quick, and then we'll jump into 1 Samuel 25 is where we're gonna be today. So you got a Bible, an iPad, phone, you wanna turn to 1 Samuel 25. But I wanted to mention to you, two weeks ago, I mentioned that our principal is sick and she's gonna be stepping away. So we're looking for a principal. I need you to pray for a principal for our school. Our school is in the business of raising up children that are kingdom-minded kids. And we believe in that deeply at Water of Life. And we still have openings for a couple of teachers, a couple of teacher's aides. Um, our HR people are out in the concourse. So if you wanna stop by and talk to them about different openings, that are at the school, it's not too late to do that. And then finally, the prayer tower. I wanna speak to you about the prayer tower really quick. When we built this building, we built a prayer tower over on the other side. And since COVID happened, it hasn't been used. It's time to be used again. We need to get back into the prayer tower and start praying. But before we can do that, we need some of you to rise up and take positions to help serve people that are coming to pray in the prayer tower. So if you'd like to do that, you can sign up. You can uh, go out and, and you can sign up in the concourse area. You can call the office and just say, look, and I wanna help get the prayer tower reopened. And then I wanna encourage all of you, you need to pray. Take time, go to the prayer tower sometimes alone and just spend time with the Lord praying because you can see across the whole valley, pray for the valley, pray for your country, pray for people, pray for leaders, pray for me and the leaders here at Water of Life. We need prayer. All of us need prayer, amen? amen. We all need prayer, but you're not very excited. You're all still mad at me for what I just said about Rowan Wade, huh? You're all trying to figure out the email you're gonna send me. Let me help you with the email. I'm going to Africa this week, so I'm not getting your email. I'm playing with you. I'm playing with you. So Pastor Bob Bryant really drove our prayer tower, and most of you know that we lost him uh, during COVID, and so he's gone. So we need to get the prayer tower going again. Finally, I want to show you this picture, uh, an update on CityLink. This is the elevation picture of what our CityLink building is going to look like down at the corner of Arrow and Citrus. So we are believe in God for this. This is, um, we got planning approval. We have raised $2 million for this so far. Uh, we are bidding contractors. We're getting bids from contractors on this right now. And we plan to break ground in October. So wanted to update you on that because we think <clears throat> this is an exciting thing that we're doing to touch more people for Jesus. So Father, we wanna to come to you right now and say thank you God for having us in such a time as this because this is a hard time to live. It's a hard time to walk with you. It's a hard time to be kingdom-minded. But that means, Holy Spirit, you get to do supernatural work in us and we get to be vessels of honor and life for you. So we pray that you would start that change and do that work in us right now. Help us to have ears to hear and eyes to see what the Spirit of God is saying for today, that we would be people that would build your kingdom and touch people in your name. And everybody said, okay, so here's where we're going. We're going to 1 Samuel 25. You want to turn your Bible, your iPad, your phone there. If you're online or one of our other campuses, we want to welcome you. This is an interesting message today that I need to tell you was not planned. So we finished a series last week on um, integrity. And so we did a three-part series on integrity. We've talked about wholeness the first week. We talked about success in life coming from skill and trust and character the second week. And then last week, Pastor Shane talked about truth and being a truth-telling person and having the character to do that. So that was the three parts of our series, our three-part series on integrity. But this week I got an email from somebody and it was really quite profound for me. I spent a long time reading it and thinking about it. And that's what's gonna make this message a little awkward and interesting because I'm going to read some of it to you, but it's about me. So that makes it awkward and interesting because it's different. Now, the reality is 25 years ago, I wouldn't have done this message. But today, I'm old, so I can do this message, okay? So <clears throat> that, that's the reality of the message today. So here's what we're going to do. Today, we're going to do part four of integrity on a three-part series. So, okay, so we're going to add a week to integrity because of this message I got uh, a week ago. So let me do some background for you if you haven't been part of this series. But integrity is not a given factor in everybody's life. It's a result of self-discipline, inner trust, the decision to be relentlessly honest in all situations with our lives. And how many of you know that's hard to do? 
I mean, it's about wholeness. It's about God putting us back together. It's about trust. It's about telling the truth. But it is more than what you say. It's who you are inside and out, that you would be whole. The dictionary defines integrity as a state of being complete and unified. When I have integrity, my words and my actions match up. And a lot of times in our culture today, and this is what we want to speak to today, is we've been taught it's okay to fudge the truth. It's okay to not be honest. It's okay to not be truthful. And it's not okay, friends. In, in the heart of God, it is not okay. Billy Graham put it this way. He said, when wealth is lost, nothing is lost. When health is lost, something is lost. When character is lost, all is lost. Now, we don't really believe that in our culture today. We really but we, we have this mentality, I can go online and lie about who I am, tell people I'm the greatest person that ever lived, even though I'm not. We, we lie often about things because we've been given permission in our culture to do that. But if you're gonna be a kingdom-minded person, if you're gonna be a follower of Jesus, if you're gonna walk with God and let Jesus be your final authority, and by the way, that's an important thing to say to you. It isn't today what the Supreme Court says. It isn't today what ideology or what party you belong to. Friends, you gotta figure this out. What is your final authority in matters of life and death? It should be this. It should be the Bible. It should be the Bible. Now the problem with that is it's not for a lot of us. Even if we call ourselves Jesus followers, it's not. We follow what we think is correct, not what Jesus said. Now, you just sang a song that said, we want to know who you are. We want to know who you are. We want to know who you really are. And we're going to really follow who you really are. Well, if you're going to know who Jesus really is, you got to read this. You got to get your big head off the couch and in the Word. You got to figure out and let the Holy Spirit teach you the heart of the Father. Because God is for you. And the Bible says, if God is for you, who can be against you? Now, it, it, here's the truth. God may not be for everything you believe in. Hello? He might not be. But that's okay because the thing about God that's amazing is he'll work with you to show you why the things that you're putting your hope or your trust in are not going to help you long term. They're going to end up hurting you long term. So God walks you through processes. He walks you through situations and he's so thoughtful. It is what we just sang. He's a good, good father. He's patient, he's kind, and he's crazy about you. So when we talk about integrity, it's not so much what we say, but it's who we are. And in turn, who we are determines what we do. And so when we start to talk about the struggle of integrity, it comes down to this. How do you live every single day? How do you live at work? How do you live at home? How do you live in your relationships with your friends, your family members? How do you live every day? How many of you know you can make good decisions when there's no pressure? Okay, let me say that again. It's easy to make good decisions when there's no pressure. It's hard to make good decisions under pressure. When pressure comes, that's when we cheat. When pressure comes, and I said this to you a couple weeks ago, that's when we start making a decision to do not what we should do, but what we like to do. Because what we like to do is usually easier than what we should do. So then we end up losing our integrity because we say, I believe this, but you don't do this. Why don't you do it? Because of pressure. So we struggle daily with situations that demand decisions between what we want to do, what we ought to do, and integrity establishes the ground rules to resolve that tension. So you make a decision in here, and then you live it out there. You make a decision, I'm gonna walk with God, I'm gonna obey Jesus, I'm gonna do the right thing that the Spirit says to me, leads me to do each day, and I'm not gonna be led by everything else. So let me read part of this email to you, and we'll jump in to 1 Samuel 25. This person says, sometimes when I'm overseas, one of the pastors in the ministries that we're partnering with overseas will ask me how Water of Life got so big. I typically go to the issue of integrity. I share with them about George Mueller and how he impacted Pastor Dan so deeply and Pastor Dan follows his principles, which are biblical principles. And specifically, about how when the church was smaller, when I started, you would allow yourself to be held accountable by people, including me, when I was just a kid out of college. I do mention that if I brought something up and it was not clear what the Bible would teach, you would never hesitate to come back and confront me about it and talk about it. Because I always believe 
that the Bible is my final authority in all matters of life and death. It's the final authority for me. I made that decision when I surrendered to Jesus. I gave up my rights when I surrendered to Jesus. I took on his belief and his passion and not mine. Jesus said this, I didn't come to be served, but I came to what? To serve. How many of you know that's not a fun journey at the beginning? But when you figure out that it's life-giving and you were really created to touch and bless other people, it's worth it. So, so this email goes on and says this, but when there was a concern about issues of integrity at Water of Life, you always took it seriously. And frankly, you were always very transparent if a problem was found and what was going to be done about it. And I emphasize that to the people I'm talking to about how you were doing that when we were small before God brought all these people and we became big. Now, what he just said is really important. I learned a lesson a long time ago, and it was this. I am S-T-U-P-I-D. Okay, with a capital S, yes, I am, yes. She said with a capital S, and yes, that is true. With a capital S, S-T-U-P-I-D. Okay, I'm stupid sometimes, and you know what? So are you. And I'm blind sometimes. I'm blind to myself, and so are you. So I need people in my life to help me. That's why we tell you, get in a small group, Partner up with other people. You've got to have people. If you're going to have integrity, you've got to have people in your life that you trust to speak into your life. And that's what he was just saying. So I figured that out a long time ago. So when people would confront me, I didn't lose my mind. I didn't freak out. I actually saw it as a blessing. And I thought this, they're trying to help me, not hurt me. And if I listen to them, it will help me because I have blind spots. And you have blind spots. Everybody in the room has what? We all do. Everybody has blind spots. We all got blind spots. And you need other people to help you see them. You need somebody to say, hey, if you make that decision, it's going to wreck your family. If you make that decision, it's going to hurt your children. If you make that decision, it's going to wound your integrity. If you make that decision, it's not going to be life-giving. You need people to speak that to you. But, but, but listen, you got to be teachable and listen if they're going to speak to you. Did you get that part? Yes. Because some of you are not. Some of you are like, I'm the boss, I own the company, I'm the dad, I'm the mom, I'm large and in charge. No, come on, that's how some of you think. You think you're large and in charge, and you are. While well, your kids are six and seven and eight and 10 years old, and when they're 18, they'll hate you. No, they will. I watch this way too many times. You gotta figure this out, man. You're called to serve people, serve people. You're called to love people, love people. If you do that now, you reap that later. But if you don't listen now, friends, if, if people are trying to speak into your journey and you won't listen to anybody, then you're just not teachable. Then if you're not teachable, they can't help you. And God can't use other people in your life the way he wants to. So, so, so having said all of that, I want to read you a story today about a woman who had integrity, and she's dealing with two men who didn't. And she's trying to save one of them from losing his destiny. Because we've said this for the last three weeks, when you lose your integrity, you lose your destiny. They always go together. God blesses people who trust him and choose to obey. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me. You'll do what I ask you to do, even if it's uncomfortable for you. Even it puts pressure on you. So let's start here. At the end of chapter 25 in 1 Samuel, I'm going to read to you the outcome, and then I'm going to tell you how we got there. So if you're online, one of our other campuses, we want to welcome you. If you're here in the worship center, let's read this loud and together. It says in chapter 25, verse 32, David replied to Abigail, praise the Lord, the God of Israel, who has sent you to meet me today. Thank God for your good sense. Bless you for keeping me from murder and from carrying out vengeance with my own hands. <laughs> so Abigail in this story, by the way, is a superhero. She's the only person who gets this right. The two guys do not get this right at all. And she saves them from themselves. So let me give you some background so you understand what's going on in the story. If you've got your Bible, your iPad, your phone, and you're looking over at, at 1 Samuel, Look at chapter 23, and let me tell you 
what's going on in David's life. David is actually running from King Saul and trying to hide from King Saul. It says in verse 15 of chapter 23, now David became aware that Saul had come out to seek his life while David was in the wilderness of Ziph at Korash. And Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David at Korash and he encouraged him in God. Thus he said to him, do not be afraid because the hand of Saul, my father, will not find you and you will become the king over Israel and I will be next to you and Saul, my father, already knows that. So the two of them made a covenant before the Lord. David stayed at Korash while Jonathan went up to his house. Then if you go down to verse 24, it says, then they arose and they went to Ziph before Saul now David and his men were in the wilderness of Maon, in the Araba, which means the desert of the south. And when Saul and his men went to seek him, they told David, and he came down to the rock and he stayed in the wilderness of Maon. And when Saul heard he was there, he pursued David in the wilderness. And Saul went on one side of the mountain. David and his men hurried to the other side of the mountain. And David was hurrying to get away from Saul, for Saul and his men were surrounding David and his men came to seize them. But a messenger came to Saul saying, hurry and come, for the Philistines had made a raid on the land. So Saul left from pursuing David, went to pursue the Philistines, and David was able to escape and went up from there and stayed in the strongholds of En Gedi. So let me, let me help you get the context. David has 600 guys, and they're running from Saul. So David has slain the giant, right? Yeah. Remember that story? Please say yes, you know. Yeah. David slay the giant, okay? And so David is famous in the land. He's been a great warrior. He's famous in the land. They've had parades for David. Everybody knows David, and David's super popular. Saul is ragingly jealous. He's freaked out that he's going to lose the throne to David, and so he's trying to kill David. And so he's chasing David with 3,000 guys. He's got 3,000 guys going across the desert trying to find David so he can kill him. David's got 600 guys, and he's, that's his little army of loyal followers, and they believe he's going to be the next king of Israel, which he ended up being. But, but I want, here's the context. I want you to think about this. You're running from Saul with 3,000 guys. Are you freaking out or what? Come on, help me, yes or no? You, you, you're, you got 3,000 guys chasing you around the desert. There's nowhere to hide. If you've ever been to En Gedi, there's no trees to hide in. There's no bushes. You're talking about rocks and desert. That's what you got, this rocks and desert. So David's trying to stay a step ahead of Saul. Now, there's another problem in this story. David has 600 men and no food. Okay, so he has no supply train to feed his guys. So he's completely dependent on other people to help feed 600 guys every single day. Let me ask you a question. Any pressure here or not? Now, I said something to you earlier. It's when we're under pressure that we make bad decisions. And that's the truth for all of us. When you get in a situation under pressure, we, most of us, make good choices when there's no pressure. It's under pressure we make what? we make bad choices and they end up wrecking our destiny and wrecking havoc on our lives. So you got this picture of David going around the desert, Saul chasing after him, he's under huge pressure and he's in danger of losing his integrity. This is when we compromise, is when we're under pressure. So pick up chapter 25, verse one, and let's read the story. It says in verse one, Samuel died. Well, Samuel was the prophet and he was trying to guide David and coach him and help him and protect him. But it, this is a big deal. All of Israel gathered together and they mourned for him. They mourned for, for, for Samuel. David was actually there. And they buried him in his house at Ramah. And David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. And there was a man in a place called Maon whose business was in Carmel. And the man was very rich. And he had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. And it came about while he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now, l let me stop there. Anytime you're shearing your sheep, that's like when the harvest is coming in. This is a good day, right? This is when the cash comes, right? Are you with me? This is like party time. Everybody's happy. We're going to get paid. It's a good day. So that's the picture. So this guy's shearing his sheep. He's shearing his sheep. And David... It says that, by the way, in verse 3, this is an important part. It says the man's name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail. And the woman was intelligent and beautiful in appearance, but the man was harsh and evil in his dealings, for he was a Calebite. No, so let me explain something to you. Nabal is a name you don't ever want to name your kid. 
okay? Because I'm glad I don't know Nabels, okay? Because Nabel means stupid and foolish. Okay, so I don't know if this kid like flunked out of kindergarten or what, but he, he's like, his name means stupid, all right? Now her name means the joy of my father. That's what Abigail means, the joy of my father. So, so, so joy of my father means stupid. Why did you get married? Uh, the answer was this was an arranged marriage. Probably since they were children. Their parents made a deal and they arranged a marriage. And joy of my father gets to marry stupid. Okay? And she, she knew he was stupid. She's going to say that to you in just a minute. She says he is his name. She actually says that. She says he is his name. He's a foolish guy. He's hard to live with. He's a nightmare. And so here you go. Nabal was shearing his sheep. So David sent 10 young men, and David said to the young men, go up to Carmel, visit Nabal, greet him in my name. And thus you shall say to him, have a long life, peace be to you, peace be over your house, peace to all that you have. Now I've heard that you have shearers, and now your shepherds have been with us, and we have not insulted them, nor have they missed anything all the days they were in Carmel. So here's what happened. Nabal's guys are out with his sheep in the middle of the desert. And if you ever go there and you, you look around, you're like, why are you out here with sheep? There's still sheep out there today. Now, if you know anything about En Gedi and where this all took place, it's the Qumran scrolls. This is where the Qumran scrolls were found. And they were found by a shepherd who was digging around in the mountains when his sheep were out there. Well, there's hardly anything to eat but brush. But there's still guys out there with sheep. So here he is, he's out in the desert, and he runs into who? David. He's got his sheep out there. These guys got their sheep out there, and they run into David. And David's guys, instead of saying, hey, we're hungry, we're going to take some of your sheep, they say, we're going to help you and protect you from robbers and animals and other people that would take your animals. We're going to be a protection for you. So David's assuming, I blessed you, now you're going to bless me back. I helped you, now you're going to what? Help me. You're going to help feed my guys. So he sends his guys in, and he says, listen, all the days that they were with us, we protected them. Now, I asked the young men, and, and they will tell you. In verse 8, he says, ask your guys, and they'll tell you, we, were, we, we helped them. Therefore, let my young men find favor in your eyes, for we've come on a festive day. That means everybody's parting, right? Please give whatever you have at hand to your servants and to your son David. And when David's young men came, they spoke to Nabal, according to all the words in David's name, and then they waited. But Nabal answered David's servants and said, who is David, and who is the son of Jesse? There are lots of servants today that are breaking away from their master. Shall I, sh should I take my bread, my water, my meat, and the things that I've slaughtered for my shears? Shall I give it to people that I don't even know? So David's young men said, uh-oh, we have a serious problem here. <laughs> was stupid. Okay, so let's keep going. <laughs> Verse 12, it says, so David's young men retraced their way and went back, and they came and told him everything that they said. And David said to his men, each of you go get your sword. So each man girded on his sword, and David got his sword, and about 400 of the men went up with David, and 200 stayed back to guard their stuff. So, 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 here, here's the deal. You got a guy who's doing the wrong thing. This is your boss. Some of you, you know, this is like, that's my boss. My boss is navel stupid. Okay, so, so, I mean, this is, some of you live under this kind of circumstance with people, and you know you do. It's frustrating for you. It creates anger inside of you, and it provokes you to act in the same spirit. Did you hear what I just said? It provokes you to act in the same spirit when God wants you to act in the opposite spirit. See, the, the Bible in, in Proverbs 15:1 it says, a gentle word turns away wrath. Literally, it means this. God wants you to be a shock absorber. He wants you to be a shock absorber. There's times that he wants to insert you as an intercessor into a crisis, and he wants you to be a healer. He wants you to be a helper, but you can't do that rationally because if you're a normal human being, you're thinking like this. I hate that person. I can't stand that person. I don't want to be around that person. I don't want to work with that person. I don't like that person. And God is saying, I understand all of that. I want you to help them. Because that's how I touch people's lives. It's the kindness of God that leads people to repentance, not anger and not vindictiveness and not vengeance. It's the kindness of God. And so he, here's where this story goes. David's young men, they come back to David and they tell him, dude, the guy's not giving you anything. 
How many know this is a bad day because David is not operating in the spirit, he's operating in his flesh. And so it says in verse, in verse what, 13, David goes and gets his sword, tells all of his guys, grab your gear, we're gonna go slaughter this guy. But one of the young men goes and tells Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, behold, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master, but our master scorned them. Yet the men were always good to us. We were never insulted. We didn't lose anything as long as we went about with them. While we were in the fields, they they protected us. They were a wall to us both by night and by day, all the time that we were tending the sheep. Now, therefore... Know this and consider what you should do, for evil is plotted against our master. Watch this. Evil is plotted against our master and all of his household, and he is such a worthless man, nobody can speak to him. (laughs) And his wife said, you're telling me I live with the guy. (laughs) No, no, really, come on. This guy just looked right at her and said, your husband is worthless. And she said, I know. (laughs) You know, I got connected with the guy and I, I have to live with him every single day. But, but this is important that you don't miss this. The reality is this is a very, very painful situation and it's pressure filled. It's just like some of you experience at work, at home, in the neighborhood, in your everyday journey. You get under pressure and the question is, what are you gonna do under pressure? So, 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 This guy, Nabal, he's hard to deal with. There's no question, he's not a smart guy. Jesus actually talked about him in a story he he wrote that that, that he spoke about that's written in, in Luke chapter 12, verse 16. It says this, he told him a story, a parable, saying the land of a rich man was very productive. He began to reason to himself and say, what should I do? I have nowhere to store all my crops. He said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger barns. Then I'll store all my grains and my goods there. And I'll say to my soul, soul, you have many things laid up for many years to come. Take ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you're a fool. That very night your soul will be required of you. And now who will own all the stuff you prepared? So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Friends, this is Nabal. He's all about who? himself. Now, some of you are living and working in situation. You're actually married to Nabal. <laughs> no, or you're married to Nabal at. You know, I, I, this is hard, friends. This is hard. This is hard. I, I, I want you to read this again with me. I'm going to put it up on the screen because I want to make a point here that you don't miss. You got one guy who's clueless and rude, that would be Nabal, and another guy who's supposed to be a king and wise, but he reacts to the rudeness in the same spirit. Does exactly what, what, what Nabal's doing to him. This is what God doesn't want you to do. That's what makes this girl a superhero in this story because she obeyed what the spirit was saying, not what the flesh was saying. So read this again with me from 1 Samuel 25, 14, to 17, let's read it loud and together. It says, but one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, behold, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master, and he scorned them. Yet the men were very good to us. We were not insulted, nor did we miss anything as long as we went about with them while we were in the fields. They were a wall to us, both by night and by day, All the time we were with them tending the sheep. Now, therefore, know and consider what you should do. For, watch this, evil is plotted against our master and all his household. And he's such a worthless man, nobody can talk to the guy. So first off, Nabal wouldn't let anybody speak into his life. He wouldn't listen. Some of you are just like this. You need to figure that out. You end up crushing your destiny if you do this. But larger than that, evil is plotted against his whole household. David's intent was to kill every single man that worked for Nabal. Who was plotting evil in this story? Say it loud. Who was it? It's David, the good guy. The good guy. Now, you need to figure out something. This is a trap from the enemy. This is exactly what the enemy does to destroy people. He puts you in a situation under pressure, 
And he wants you to react with the same spirit the person that you're dealing with has. And when you do that, it destroys your integrity, destroys your character, destroys your destiny. You cannot walk with God and disobey what the Spirit is saying. What the Spirit is saying to you, some of you, is you are created for such a time as this. I want you to be the peacemaker. I want you to insert yourself in the circumstance and bring healing to the person that's so wounded and broken. But you're so angry at the person, you couldn't ever see that, even when the Spirit is speaking it to you. Now, watch what happens in this story because it's very interesting. She honors stupid, her husband. No, Abigail does that. She honors them. She read these men instantly, and she, be, she makes a decision to intercede for everybody. When I say intercede, it's important you understand the word. I'm not talking about praying. I'm talking about putting yourself in the middle of the battle. She was not going to be killed in this battle. You need to understand that. David was going to kill all of the men that worked for Nabal. But she was now going to put herself at massive risk by going into this thing when she didn't have to. Why would she do that? Because God asked her to. Why should you do that? Because God has asked you to. Some of you know this. You know the Holy Spirit's come to you and said, I want you to be a peacemaker here. And you said, no, they don't deserve to have any peace. I deserve to have vengeance. They haven't treated me right. And instead of yielding and allowing the Spirit of God to use you as a healer, you've determined that you should be able to get vengeance for what's happened to you. Now watch the story unfold here because this is super important that you get this. David obviously had lost his mind and he was in danger of losing his integrity and his destiny as king because of Nabal. So that, 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 that's the story here, because of Nabal. So Jesus tells you how to not do this. Watch, Matthew chapter 5, 38. You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And David said, amen, I'm getting that, right? But I say to you, do not resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other one to him also. If anybody wants to sue you and take your shirt, let them have your coat as well. Uh, here's the problem with that text. All of you have heard this. Turn the other cheek. And you think this. What Jesus is asking you to do is become a doormat for God. Just let people walk over you. That is not what he's saying. That is not what Jesus is saying. He's saying this, act in the opposite spirit of the person that's coming against you. Because the enemy is involved in this, it's a spiritual strategy to destroy you. If you operate in the same spirit as the person who's blowing you up, you become just like that person. If David operates in the same spirit as Nabal, he becomes just like Nabal. And Jesus is saying, here's how you keep your integrity. Act in the opposite spirit. Don't, a gentle word turns away wrath. Be a shock absorber for God. Now, here's what some of you are thinking. No way, it ain't happening. But, 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 but listen, you need to figure this out. When you do this, when you do this, you position yourself to be a large part of what God is doing in this kingdom to touch and build people. So, so watch Abigail here. Watch what she does in verse 18. Abigail, it says, hurried and took 200 loaves of bread, two jugs of wine, five sheep already prepared, five measures of roasted grain, 100 clusters of raisins, 200 cakes of figs, and she loaded them all on her donkeys. And she said to her young men, go on before me because I'm coming after you. So she told some of the guys that David knew that were shepherds, you guys go out there, he won't kill you because he knows you, tell him I'm coming to, to make this right. So she's, made, she's very strategic, and by the way, she said, it says she hurried. So she's super strategic. She understands this is a pressure-filled moment, and she is not running from the battle. She's running to the battle. She's not running away. Listen, she has everything to lose in this and nothing to gain. She doesn't have to do this. She's married to stupid, and David's going to take him out. <laughs> Hello, right? Yet she does the right thing because she knows it's the right thing. She has integrity. Watch what happens here. She, she goes and she loads up all of her stuff. She didn't, it says it at the end of verse 19, but she did not tell her husband Nabal. Then it came about as she was riding her donkey and coming down the hidden part of the mountain. Behold, David and his men were coming down towards her, so she met them. 
Now David had said, surely in vain I've guarded all this guy's stuff in the wilderness, so nothing was missed, everything that belonged to him, and he's returned evil for my good. May God do so to the enemies of David, and more also if by morning I leave as much as one of his guys alive who belong to him. So, 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 hold, please notice this, because we do this all the time today in our culture. Not only was David operating out of his flesh, but he put God's name on it. Did you notice that? You know, God's with me. He's going to be happy that I get to murder everybody. And how many of you know we do this today? We do. Christians do this all the time. We do the wrong thing, and then we say it's Jesus. And it breaks God's heart, friends. It's not how the Spirit operates. Now, when I tell this story, a lot of you are sitting there going, there's no way I'm going to ever do this. you got to get this. Often the Spirit will ask you to do things that are not rational. They're not logical, but they are very spiritual. They will go against what, uh, uh, what you can, everything that in your reasoning that makes you think this should operate a certain way because God is not after the outside. He's after the inside. He's trying to change people from the inside out. So here comes Abigail. She puts herself in harm's way. She's in huge danger. She doesn't know if David's going to blow her up in a second. She, I mean, she knows he's lost his mind, and she jumps right off her donkey, and, and, and she falls on the ground in front of her, and she says it in verse 24, she fell at his feet and said, on me alone, O Lord, would be the blame. Hold it. What has she done wrong in this story? Has she done anything wrong? Nothing. But she understands a dynamic that a lot of us don't. Humility is a strength in the spiritual realm. She humbles herself, and she completely disarms David. It says, when she falls off, she bows down, she falls at his feet, and she takes the blame. Please let your maidservant speak to you and listen to the words of your maidservant. Verse 25, please do not let my Lord pay attention to this worthless man, stupid, for as his name, so he is. Hello, she's married to this guy. Okay. So she just calls him out completely. Nabal is his name and folly is with him, but I, your maidservant, never saw you young men coming that you sent. Now, therefore, my Lord, now watch, watch what, this is a supernatural moment. She starts to prophesy over David. So she's anointed for such a time as this. God has his hand on her life. He's promised to speak supernaturally, and then she starts to speak prophetically over David. She says to him, now my Lord, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, since the Lord has restrained you from shedding blood and from avenging yourself by your own hand, now let your enemies and those who seek evil against my Lord be as Nabal. Now let this gift which your maidservant has brought to you be given to the young men who accompany you. Please forgive the transgression of your maidservant, for the Lord will certainly make for my Lord an enduring house. Hold it. She's now speaking into the future of David's life. What she's done is her humility. David came with his gun loaded, man. He's ready to blow up everybody. And she's completely disarmed him. She's taken every bullet out of his gun by her humility and her kindness. And she says to him, here's what's going to happen. Since the Lord has restrained you from shedding blood and avenging yourself by your own hand, let your enemies be as those who seek evil like Nabal. Now let this gift which, you, which, which I brought be for you. Please forgive the transgression because certainly the Lord will build for you an enduring house because my Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord and evil will not be found in you all of your days. Should anyone rise up to pursue you and seek your life, then the life of my Lord will be bound in a bundle with the living Lord of our God. But the lives of your enemies he will sling out from the hollow of a sling. And when the Lord does that for my Lord, according to all the good he has spoken concerning you, David, and appoints you ruler over Israel, this will not cause grief or trouble to your heart, both by shedding blood without cause and by having avenged yourself. When the Lord deals well with my servant, please remember me. Now, you gotta get this. Her husband's response was, who's David and who's the son of Jesse? Well, everybody in the land knew who David was. He knew who David was. But he so discounted David that he blew David up. This is what some of you deal with every day at work, at home, in your journey. You deal with people who discount you, who wound you, who strike at you with their words, and then in your heart, you formulate a way to get back at them. 
And what God is trying to say to some of you today is, don't do that. Let me in the journey, I can help you. Let me have my way, I can heal you. Let me use you supernaturally to speak into a person's life, but only that will only happen if you obey me, if you yield to me and allow my spirit to use you as an intercessor, to be in the middle of the battle. She put herself right, right in harm's way for everybody else's sake. She, wasn't, she had nothing to gain here, but she saved David's destiny. So here's a question for you. How many of us haven't listened to the Holy Spirit when he's asked us to do this? I mean, I know there's times I haven't. How many of us haven't that God has got you in a situation and he's asked you over and over, please let me use you to bring healing. Please let me use you to be a peacemaker. Please let me use you to restore. And your answer was no, I'm gonna have my way and you wrecked havoc on yourself. And then you look at God and you get mad at God. And you say, you don't love me, you don't care for me, and God's like, I'm crazy about you, but you need to obey me. Remember what David said to her? We read it at the beginning. Blessed be your discernment. This girl was amazing because she heard from God and she obeyed God. Verse 32, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, who sent you this day to meet me. And blessed be your discernment, blessed be you, because you kept me from bloodshed and avenging myself. Nevertheless, as the Lord God of Israel lives, who, ha who has restrained me from harming you, unless you would come quickly to meet me, surely there would not have been left to Nabal one man, one guy. So David received from her hand what she brought up and said to her, go up to your house in peace, for I have listened to you and granted your request. And Abigail came to her husband Nabal. Behold, he was having a party at the house like the king of a feast. And Nabal's heart was very merry and he was super drunk. So she didn't tell him anything about what happened that night. But in the morning when the wine had gone out of Nabal, his wife told him everything and his heart died within him. So he became like a stone and 10 days later he died. Let me read you something and we'll be done. Here's another part of that paragraph, another paragraph of that email that was sent to me. The Sierra property was a good example of people challenging you. Yes, it was wonderful that we bought the property for $5 million, sold it for $22 million five years later, giving us $17 million increase in just five years. But I also tell people how for 20 years before that, we always gave away 10 to 15% of all the money that came in at Water of Life to care for the poor, other ministries, or missionaries. So we, at this point, had a $17 million increase. And I went to certain leaders and elders on our board, and I asked them a question. Are you now going to give away $1.7 million? Hello? <clears throat> Let me say that again because you're thinking about getting to lunch and wondering how long I'm gonna take. I'm gonna land the plane right now, okay? Are you going to give away $1.7 million? And they would smile at me and say, we've all been talking about that because we all knew that we had to do that. We all knew this wasn't an accident. It was because we'd been faithful all the time before for 20 years to tithe off of that money to other people. I remember the lesson you learned from Billy Graham when you were with him one day and he received a million dollar check and he handed it off to other people and that struck you so deeply and that did happen. Most of you know that story. I was struck because this guy hands Billy Graham a million dollars and he didn't even look at it. He just handed it to a guy and gave it away to the poor and I was just struck by that. And then he said this, but the Sierra property was 17 times greater than that. But we had developed a discipline over years and years and years. We knew we had to give away $1.7 million that we did. And we did. See, it's not $100 million or $100. It's not how much you have. It's how you deal with what you have. That's always how God sees this, friends, always. And so what the Lord is trying to say to some of you today is integrity comes with accountability. You have to let people speak into your life. You got to get in a place where you trust other people and they can speak into your life. Some of you don't ever do that. And when they do try to speak to you, you don't listen. 
You, you are Nabal. No, come on, S-T-U-P-I-D. Okay, let's keep going. You need to believe this, that God will protect you. He's crazy about you. He'll help you through the journey. This guy closes the letter with this thought. I almost hate to admit it, but there are times when I am so frustrated when people bring their concerns to me at work. And he, he's in leadership. I mean, he's a large and in charge guy, right? He's over a bunch of people. But I would literally think to myself, Pastor Dan used to let me hold him accountable when he had the power to not have to. So I need to shut my mouth and listen to what this person has to say to me. I can even force myself at times to say, please tell me about that, even when it's about me and it's bad. Instead of reacting, I usually can gain some insight into how a situation is being perceived. I might not agree with the way that they're attributing it to me, but often their perspective is helpful in finding a way to get better results. Stand with me, would you? And bow your heads. Because this is a really important moment for some of you. You have what I call, some of you have this, a spiritual bondage. You strike back at people all the time. And you think you're justified in doing that because everybody's taught you that that's okay. But friends, if you're a Jesus follower, you can't do that. You lost that right at the cross. Jesus didn't strike back at people. He didn't strike back. He doesn't want you to strike back. So Holy Spirit, we come to you right now. We say, God, help us not to follow our culture, not to follow an ideology, but to follow Jesus, to follow your heart, Father, for people, that you could use us to be intercessors. You could use us to be peacemakers. You could use us to be shock absorbers. God, you could use us to be healers of circumstances and situations, and people would see there's something different about us because we've allowed the Holy Spirit to move in us that you would give us supernatural words to speak into situations because we yielded to you, that you would give us a spirit of humility, God, instead of vengeance. Now, some of you are really caught in this place. If that's you, I would like you to slip your hand up right now so I can pray for you. If you're stuck and you know this is you, that good for you, way to go. Good for you. There's a lot of us here. A lot of us are stuck here, friends, because we've been given permission to treat people this way. So I want to ask you to do something right now. We're going to close with a song. We're going to worship together for just a moment. We'll be done. But I want to ask you to come to the front. Let me pray for you before you go home. As we start worshiping, just come down to the front. This is a spiritual issue. This isn't a counseling issue. This isn't a talk to your husband or wife issue. This is a spiritual bondage that you need healing from. So I want to pray for you before we go home. Let's worship right now. If that's you, make your way down to the front. And I want to pray for you before we leave.
Some of you, you doubt what I just taught you. Let me sum it up with a verse for him. In the book of Proverbs, it says, lean not on your own understanding, but trust in the Lord with all your heart, because his ways are not your ways. He doesn't see things like we see them, friends. And when you lean on your own understanding, you lean on your own ideology, you lean on your own sense of what's right or wrong instead of what the Spirit is saying to you. It doesn't make sense sometimes when God asks you to be the intercessor. Put yourself in danger like Abigail did. But God is trying to build an army of Abigails, not David's and Nabal's, but Abigail. And so, Holy Spirit, we come to you right now with desperation. Some of us were in bad places, God. We've struck the people that we love the most. We've hurt our reputation, our integrity with our families, with our children, with our parents, with our bosses and our friends in order to be right. And so, God, we want to come to you today and say this is a bondage for us. This is a place where the enemy has stolen life from us, put us in a place where we would become a slave to him and to ourselves. And we wanna come to you right now and ask you in the name of Jesus to break that from us, Lord, to heal that off of us, God, to stop that work of darkness and bring light into the circumstance, the situation. We want, Lord, to be Abigail. We wanna be intercessors. We wanna be shock absorbers. We wanna be people that would bring peace in a circumstance that's a battle and a struggle and pressure filled. That God, next time we find ourselves under pressure and in danger of losing our mind and losing our heart and losing our destiny, that we would cry out to you and say, God, help me to trust you, not my flesh, not what people have told me. Help me to trust you. I don't understand what you're asking me to do, but I need you to speak into me and speak through me supernaturally. And so, Holy Spirit, we come to you right now. We believe you are the one who can free us, that you can break off the things that we've allowed in our spirit to control us and drive us to be people of vengeance, that today, in the name of Jesus, you would touch each heart up here. Everybody's got a story, God. We all have a reason why we should be able to avenge ourselves. But you want to say to every person up here, I want you to be a peacemaker. I want you to learn the strategy of humility. I want you to learn what it means to bow down and be a shock absorber for me. I want to use you supernaturally to touch other people. So we ask right now, Satan, we want to declare to you that your work would end here today, that we would sever any ties that you've created in the hearts of people, and that Jesus, we would give you freedom to move and go to and fro inside of us to clean up the messes that we've created. Show us what we need to do to make this right, Father. And then use us, God, to heal and bring life to other people. Thank you, Lord. Please hear the cry of our hearts, God. We are helpless without you, but with you, God, we are indestructible. So we ask you to have your way. Move with power, move with authority, and bring life to each person up here in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. Way to go. If you want more prayer, our prayer team will come up and pray over you. God bless you. Have a great week. Have a great week. Well, what a powerful message by our very own pastor. I want to encourage you that maybe something today uh, resonated with you. And here's the thing, you don't have to experience this or do this alone, but we have people that would love to pray for you. Just like people, um, hundreds are responding at the altar right now, um, inviting God into this. If that's you, and I know even though you're on the side of screens or keyboards, don't let that stop you, but let somebody come and enter into the journey with you. Um, So if you're on Facebook, go ahead and send us a message that you just need some prayer. And one of our pastors will reach out, you're on church online. Click the I Need Prayer button, or if you need to talk to somebody in person, we have people that would be by the phone, so you can call us at 909-463-0103. Love to pray for you. Well, family, we love you each week. It is just 
um, an amazing time. Uh, we truly value and honor this time. We honor you and just are grateful each week that you come to hang out with us online. We'll be back next week. And until then, we love you. Have a great week.